Uh, elders and deacons, by the way, meet after church for a very, what I hope to be a brief meeting. About 850 years ago, they decided to build a bell tower next to the cathedral in Pisa, Italy. And by the time they reached the third story, they discovered the tower was leaning. They tried all sorts of things to fix the problem, but it didn't work. So they kept on building. It took them 174 years to build it. It went 186 foot in the high, and it was now 18 foot off center. And every year it leaned a little more. In fact, it got so bad by 1990, they closed it down to the public, and they tried to fix it again. They took the bells out, they attached cable anchors, they put 800 metric tons of lead in the opposite direction. And then $25 million later, they put in 110 tons of dirt. It only leans about 16 foot today. But it was reopened in 2003, so you can go visit it. They say it'll be good for another 200 years. What was the problem? Bad design? No. Bad workmanship? No, not at all. Bad. Inferior grade of marble? No. The problem was what was underneath. The sandy soil where they chose to build and the design of the monument, the ground was just not stable enough to handle it. Literally, the monument has no firm foundation. Sounds a lot like a parable of Jesus, doesn't it? And this one our children sing about all the time. Rains came down and the floods came up. You probably even know the song. I was going to get Timmy to sing it this morning, but he had never heard it before. <laughs> no, I'm lying about that. But you know the song. So listen to the parable. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Rains came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Rains came down, the streams came up, and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell with a great crash. Now, on first glance, that seems pretty easy to figure out today. Jesus says when it comes down to it, you got two kinds of people. Those who hear my words and put them into practice, and those who hear my words and don't put them into practice. And he takes it a step further. He said those who hear his words and obey and put them into practice are wise people. But those who hear and refuse to obey and put it into practice are called foolish people. In fact, in the Greek, the word is moron. <laughs> now, it's safe to say that both groups of people had the opportunity to hear what Jesus wanted to say. And it's safe to say that they both seem interested in building a house. And instead of talking about it, they both actually built a house. They both faced the same storms of life. They, they both assumed by the way they were living that they had all the bases covered. But when the storm came, the difference in the foundation brought safety to one and destruction to another. So why does Jesus give that parable? And like last Sunday we said, you need to go back and look at the context. Scripture just doesn't randomly occur in the Bible. It is always in some type of a context situation. This is neat because this parable today is the conclusion to what they call the Sermon on the Mount. That's the longest scripture, longest sermon we have in the scripture uh, that Jesus ever spoke. It's three chapters long, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And obviously we're not going to read that, but I do want to hit the high points. Now most of this you're going to remember, you're going to say, hey, I've heard sermons about this, I heard this in Sunday school, because this is the greatest sermon of Jesus. So I'm pretty much assuming you know what it is, but just in case you don't, I'm going to give you a, a, bird, excuse me, a bird's eye view of it. 
Jesus starts out with a bunch of statements that begin with the word blessed or happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are who mourn, because they be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will seek God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for God, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. And then, in what I think is kind of the theme of Jesus' sermon, he says two things about us. He says, we are the salt of the earth. We influence the people around us by the very way we live. He says, we are the light of the world. We influence the world around us by what we say and what we do. And in now, at this point in this sermon, Jesus is sort of going to establish his authority. He says, you know, back in the old days, they said, don't murder. But I tell you, if you get angry with somebody, you're in danger of hellfire. And he said, back in the old days, they said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you lust after somebody, you've already committed adultery. He said, back in the old days, Moses gave you some rules to keep you from divorcing too quickly. Well, I tell you, marriage is sacred. You better try to work it out. He says, back in the old days, he said, keep the oath you make to God. But I tell you, don't even swear at all. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. He said, you heard back in the old days. And it's literally, he keeps saying back in the old days. Back in the old days... It's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, they smack you on the right side, you turn and let them smack you on the left. He says, back in the old days, you heard love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for the people who hurt you. And then if he didn't want to not torque somebody off, he talks about all these religious leaders that we, we've talked about for several weeks now. They, don't, they just don't get along. And he says, people, stop trying to make sure everybody sees you being religious. You don't have to let people see all the good things you do. And stop trying to impress everybody by the way you pray. And just to make sure we get that part of the sermon, this is where he teaches us the Lord's Prayer. And then in the next section, he gets to another heart. In fact, he gets to his number one teaching. Of all the things that Jesus said when he was on this planet, you already know what number one is, because I told you 37 times. But if you didn't catch it, the number one thing he talks about is money. And he has good advice. He says, don't. Don't stir, stir it up treasures on the earth where you have to worry about moths and rust and thieves and Wall Street. Put your treasures in heaven. And he comes off and he says, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to love money or you're going to love God. And then, he, of course, he talks a very famous part where he says, stop worrying then. God's going to take care of you. Stop worrying about this. He's going to clothe the lilies in the fields. He'll take care of you. And then he'll tell us to stop judging. And then He's almost through. He's coming down to a close here. Very important part, he says, do unto others as you'd have them do to you. Still good advice. You ought to try it. And then as he draws it down home, he has two bold statements. He says, people, you need to stay on the narrow road because the narrow road goes through the narrow gate that goes to life everlasting. But if you're on that wide road, it goes to that wide gate, you're probably on the wrong road because it's heading for destruction. So watch out for false teachers. He says, by the way they live, you'll know they're false teachers. Now, I didn't give that much justice, but that three chapters of Scripture is Jesus' sermon. Now, here is a full conclusion, his words, not mine. This is the end. Nothing else after this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down and the storms rose and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. <coughs> but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great clash. Now, the interpretation. We started with a parable, went to the context. How are we to interpret this? A lot of times preachers and Sunday school teachers and a lot of wonderful, really wonderful people simply say, well, the person who built on the sand is a non-believer. He's a non-Christian. He's a person who decided not to follow Jesus. And the person who built his house on the rock is a person who decided to become a Christian, a believer, and follow Jesus. That's the easy version. A lot of that's true, but it's too simple. By now, since you've heard so much about the parable... You already realize Jesus is talking to two groups of people who are really trying to follow him. Those who hear his words, and they put them into practice. And those who hear his words, but never get around to that full obedience part. So after interpret interpretation always comes application. What do we do about this? This could be the number one biggest problem in the American church today. I think personally we all wrestle with this. Like it says on the screen, the affirmation of faith is not enough. Faith always has to lead to obedience. Parables don't fit the culture of the American church very well because a lot of the churches in America today Urge people to accept Jesus, to believe in Jesus, but make no requirements, no demands of people's life and behavior. In order to gain more members, they often dilute the message ever so slightly to lessen these seemingly strict demands of Jesus. And not surprisingly, this diluted message of mainstream Christianity has come to be just believe in Jesus. Close your eyes, raise your hands, and say, I believe in Jesus. And over and over again, like a hammer, we are pounded with the statement, we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace. And let me be the first one to tell you that I certainly believe that. We are truly saved by grace. But if you read the rest of your Bible, you're going to discover that faith is not faith unless it is accomplished, accompanied by obedience. Faith isn't faith unless we put it into practice. Just believing in Jesus is not enough. Well, you say, Daniel, how can you say that? Well, read the book of James. He says the very devil believes in Jesus. Devil's convinced with all his heart that Jesus is alive and well and the Son of God. It's not doing him a whole lot of good now, is it? Because he refuses to put that into practice in his life. Who I believe is not the point this morning. The point is, who am I following? Who am I obeying by the very way I live? And we don't talk much about obedience. And part of the reason we don't say a whole lot about obedience in church is this horrible fact that when you talk, talk, start talking about obedience, 
people often just walk out the back door because they don't want to hear that part of the parable. In fact, our culture is turned off by obedience. We are taught to question, if not openly defy, authority. It is not politically correct to demand obedience. But being a disciple of Jesus requires obedience to what he taught. And there's our predicament this morning with this parable. We want to choose what we want to believe. And what we want to believe, what our opinions are, is what we want our Bibles to say. And so consciously or subconsciously, just most all of us, at times, rewrite our Bible to fit what it is we really want, rather than, of course, do what Jesus wants. We want to write to shape our own religion. I mean, after all, we want the things that please us and bring us peace and prosperity. You know, what I'm saying right now might be why in the 21st century, people can become an active member of some churches without ever realizing that they're supposed to be following Jesus. That's not good. There's another parable that's often associated with this parable in another place. I want to read that real quick to you. And then we'll, we'll bring this thing down to a close. Je again, it's Jesus. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build but was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? And if he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other's still a long way away and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, <coughs> he has cannot be my disciple. The stories of Jesus are clear, and they are so simple to understand. Who would ever start a tower without counting enough to see if they have enough money to finish it? What king would think about going to attack another king with a superior number of forces coming against him? What's the point of both parables today? It's this. You and I need to think through all of this very carefully. Becoming a Christian will change the allegiance you have to many, many things in life. Becoming a disciple of Jesus will most definitely change your allegiance to many things in life. Becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus, will require a shift away from our own selfishness and self-centeredness. Becoming a disciple of Jesus will most definitely change the way we handle our financial resources and blessings. And honest and truly, you need to know all of that before you ever put the first foot into the baptistry. But now is it worth it? And I just let me say it this way. Imagine a world that we really influence society and culture by who we are. Uh, imagine a, a world where what we believe and what we say and how we live actually does change people. Imagine where a world where people no longer abuse each other verbally or even physically, where we don't lust and violate marriage vows, always tell the truth, don't retaliate with violence, and we actually learn to love enemies. Man, who wouldn't want to live there? Uh, imagine a world where we use all that God has blessed us with to actually help and bless other people. To reach out into our communities to say a simple message about Jesus. And back that message up by our love for one another. That world is coming and it looks like it might come pretty soon. 
And this Easter Sunday, we're going to actually visit that coming kingdom. We hear a lot about it. We read a lot about it in the book of Revelation. And we're going to, just for seven weeks, we're going to take a survey of Revelation to see what's coming and how important it is. But I want you to know this today. If you want to live in that world that is coming, you better start learning to live in this world where the kingdom is already here. That's just kind of the plan. We need to help people understand more what it means to become a follower of Jesus. As a church, we need to be more open about what we believe. And as, a, as individuals, we got to make sure that our opinions match the word of the Scripture and never let our opinions become scripture. Looking good is not good enough. Knowing right is not right enough. Yeah, we have to put into practice what we know is right. Stand with us as we share a final song with you this morning. 